Good morning, everyone. Um, we're here at last. It's um, been a long time coming. Uh, I don't think I've ever been preparing for a talk longer than this one. <laughs> and, and that's just not the last two years I've been preparing. It's the last 40 years. Let, let me start, though, by um, building on our welcome to country and acknowledge the Jagera, Giabal, and uh, Jab, Jab, Jarawea peoples uh, who are the traditional owners on the land in which this amazing uh, theatre is built. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, um, um, so those of you who are old enough to take your minds back to 1973, um, that's where I'd like to start. Uh, and those of you um, who don't remember 1973 for whatever reason, and there's, there's a few I can think of. <laughs> the younger ones, of course, are excused, but the older ones who don't remember it, well, we'll we won't go there. But um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of, of a story at, around the 70s and, and try and bring you through to the current day. So 1973, Gough Whitlam was the Australian Prime Minister. Here in Queensland, it was a darker time with Joe Bielke Peterson years, he was Premier. The Queen, um, now the late Queen, opened the Sydney Opera House. And all the students of popular Australian culture will of course know that ACDC performed for the first time in Sydney. So, and it was also the year that I uh, entered first year agricultural science at the University of Queensland. That was just a blip on the agronomic radar, but the thing that was more significant in agronomy in 1973 was that Colin M. Donald retired as the Wake Professor of Agriculture and Head of the Department of Agronomy at the University of Adelaide. So a few months short of 50 years later, it is 50 years, um, I stand here honoured to be receiving the, the Donald Medal for Agronomy. There are 18, I think, other, others who have received this citation in the history of the award. I know some of them are here today. I met at least two last night. There might be more that I haven't met yet. Now, many of my agro agronomy heroes from, from my career, from days past, uh, are in that list of 18, and, and I find it somewhat daunting to, um, to be in their company and, and present an oration that's up to what they've done before. So, um, this narrative is a, an unashamedly personal recollection of the state of agronomy in the early 70s, and it seeks to track that evolution um, to the present day. The focus is largely Australian, but at times international um, comparisons are called upon. And um, so the talk structured around these three areas. Um, my, own, my own journey, stepping back and looking at the wider agronomic journey and then reflections. So my own journey starts here in, in the 1970s at the University of Queensland undergraduate days, some of my graduating class there. There's at least one Director General of Agriculture in that photo. Um, outside the Hartley Teagle building, which many will know at, at St. Lucia. Um, I'm, I'm standing in the middle with the short shorts and long hair. So uh, hair and dress fashions have changed, fortunately, um, but that's where I started. Um, um, I was interested in, I got interested in agriculture, I was a city boy, but I got interested in agriculture because of my interest in plants and plant diversity fascinated me. And you would have thought I got into plant breeding and that's probably what first attracted me to agriculture, the idea of plant breeding and the variation that comes from that. But serendipity struck in 76 and an opportunity arose for a post-grad project in agronomy. Uh, that was uh, with the tropical root crop cassava and I embarked on a PhD, an extravaganza of white peg trials for the next four years. And I quickly came to recognise that environment and management could have at least as big an effect on plant growth and development as did genetics. So lots of, lots of trials, uh, lots of planting date studies, growth curves uh, in a subtropical environment. Um, uh, 
lots of uh, indicators of how environments shape plant growth and development. But, but reflecting back now on Australian agronomy in the 1970s, um, my contention, as I see it now, is that it was not seen as the cutting edge of agricultural science. It wasn't seen necessarily as a prestige career course. There was a number of terms that often raised um, implied agronomy was more of an empirical art than a scientific endeavour. Notions such as rates and dates, spray and prey are a couple of examples. Unlike the US, where the American Society of Agronomy dates back to 1907, uh, Australia had no agronomy society in the 70s um, and tended to focus on more specialised uh, professional societies, um, plant physiology, soil science, animal science and so on. Um, and it wasn't until 1980 that we saw the first um, Australian Society of Agronomy meeting at Gatton, just down the hill from here. And I, I attended that meeting as a postgrad student. But I think I graduated from four years of agricultural science without ever hearing about crop and soil simulation modelling. Um, I heard nothing about uh, C.T. DeWitt, even though he had led the way in, in modelling a decade earlier. I, I did actually hear about C.M. Donald's idiotype, and I did hear about Henry, Henry Nix's agroclimate uh, analysis in Australian cropping. And I'll return to both uh, of those gentlemen later. Um, so ag agronomy's core methods in the 70s, from my recollection, um, we can, others will no doubt debate this and we'll have talks after at some point. But we were taught, you posed a question, uh, you selected some treatments, um, you recorded your observations, and you went straight to your statistician to do an analysis of variance to see if any of those treatments were significantly different. That was the beginning and end of it. Now, those experimental re results were, were highly conditional on site and seasonal factors. Um, and we were really limited in our capacity to understand what um, was going on in those experiments. <clears throat> the idea of a probabilistic base to interventions in dryland agriculture was almost nowhere to be seen. And there were no methods available to agronomists to deal with the riskiness of farm management at the time. Now, just think about it, it was a, another 10 years before French and Schultz uh, would provide us with a simple quantitative foundation to explore water use and crop yield. That wasn't until 84, so we're, I'm talking here 74, 73. Um, there were some agricultural economists, most notably from the University of New England, who were starting to develop some theory and methods to explore agricultural decision making under risk. And I'll recognise here um, Jock Anderson, Hardacre, John Dillon. But it was actually some time before agronomists took any notice of that work. Um, so I put, I put the notion of white pegs in the title of this talk. And uh, uh, in my research, up until last night actually, um, the earliest uh, origins I could find for that term were, was a paper from Henry Nix in 1980. And Henry wrote, <coughs> Uh, the prevailing conventional white peg agronomy is deeply entrenched component of crop research. Statistical differentiation of treatment effects in situations where site and season interactions may account for a major share of the total variance is not conducive to understanding nor to the development of general functional relationships. Um, now, two points arise from that. Henry passed away earlier this year and um, I'd like to acknowledge his passing. Uh, he was one of the first people from CSRO I ever met. I went looking for a job with him uh, or his support in getting a CSRO postdoc in about 1979. <clears throat> so the part Henry played in the story of Australian agronomy is forgiving it, and I hope that becomes clear before I finish this talk. Now, la last night I was talking to John Angus, and uh, it just shows you, you never stop learning. And John, John pointed out to me this paper, which he sent me overnight. And it's a great paper. I've never seen it before. So Angus, Basinski, and Nix, 1974. And it does use the term white pig agronomy. 
So, John, all credit to you for that. And I'm not saying it is the first, but it could well be. But I know Henry Nix is an author on both. So let's, let's acknowledge Henry as well. So um, going beyond white pigs in my PhD program, so my cassava trials were driven by a desire um, to determine where cassava might be adapted in Australia. And we had all this growth rate data for different uh, environmental conditions. Um, but, and we tried to build ourselves some models of, well, how could we predict what sort of rates of growth we might get <clears throat> in relation to things like radiation and temperature and so on. But these were effectively statistical models. And there's all sorts of confounding factors at play, as you can imagine. So this was 79 by this stage. So there were mechanistic simulation models starting to appear. I think Peter Carberry started his PhD in about 82, Peter. Uh, and it was fully on simulation models. But in 79, uh, I was writing up my PhD and hadn't discovered them, basically. But once again, another learning in preparing this talk, I went back through earlier Donald orations. And, um, and um, one of my supervisors was Professor Graham Wilson. And Graham gave the Donald Oration in 1992. And um, this, is, this is a quote that I read for the first time last year. So Graham said, I am profoundly ignorant on the subject of simulation modeling, which has come to occupy a dominant position in crop physiology. So, so that's why I never discovered simulation models. But, um, um, uh, two pioneers in simulation modelling, uh, Bob Loomis from California and David Connor, ended up as my PhD examiners. So you can imagine this was potentially a, a pretty bad thing. But they were really kind to me uh, and they didn't fail me for my lim limited analytical uh, toolkit in 1980, but they did point out where I could have gone with that work. And, and subsequently, that data was eventually used to build cassava models and so on. So, um, we're into the early 80s now. I was looking for a job. Uh, I wanted to go to, to work uh, with Monteith's group on, in their controlled environment facilities. I think they were in Sutton Bonington, is that right? People remember that? That's what I remember anyway. I think it might have been Chinong working with Monteith. I applied for a CSRO postdoc to go there. Henry Nix was my sponsor. Didn't get that. I was about to go to Mexico as a postdoc uh, 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 for, with Simit. And it was only um, some months before that was likely to happen. And <clears throat> I got a phone call from Ted Hensel, uh, featured on this slide. Ted, Ted, Ted was chief of the CSRO Tropical Crops and Pastures. He said a vacancy had arisen through the untimely death of Colin Andrew. Colin might be known to some. He was a fairly well-known plant nutritionist. And will I come around to have a chat about it? So jobs in CSRO in those days were really few and far between. And so that was the first of, um, so I, I quickly went around and had a chat. And, um, and the rest is history, as they say. <clears throat> first of many chats I had in CSRO over the next 36 years. I don't think I ever proactively applied for a job in CSRO, even that first one. Um, things just emerged and, um, I had the opportunity to see if I could do it. So um, my early time in CSRO was not particularly well focused. Fuzzy ideas about legume adaptation on heavy clay soils to the west of here, Dolby. We did a lot of work at Dolby. I'm not sure we um, solved a lot of problems, but I sure, sure learnt a lot. Um, initially as a plant nutritionist and then uh, with a host of soil plant relationship issues. And in those days, CSRO soils was co-located with CSRO crops and pastures. And I used to hang out a lot with the soils people. Um, um, and uh, the soils exposure early in my career was really uh, important to the later developments. Um, by the late, um, sorry, by 1984, funding cuts in CSRO, sounds familiar. I, I had to go somewhere. I couldn't stay in the job I was doing. Ted Enzel caught me in the corridor again, and we had another chat. Uh, it was amazing how informal these things were in those days. He said there was this new agency called ACIAR starting up, and they wanted to get some work going in Africa. 
I, I, could, um, I, could, I could, could stay in the division, but I couldn't stay in Brisbane. So I could go to um, Zaria in northern Nigeria, Machakos in eastern Kenya, or Catherine in the Northern Territory. So that was the, where, where the Australian end of the project was. I gave my wife, Marianne, the choice. We had two kids under four by this stage. And she, she chose Kenya of those three. Turned out to be an inspired choice because it was the foundation of my career. Uh, and, and forever grateful that she took on that not inconsiderable challenge of, of taking a, a young family to <coughs> to rural Africa, rural Kenya. And this turned out to be my real PhD, I believe. So I'll return to that a little bit later. Um, by the early 90s, I was back in Australia. Apsru was starting up. Um, uh, Apsru was the brainchild of John Leslie from the DPI in Queensland and Bob Clements. Both uh, the CSRO and the state government departments were getting into this decision support and modelling, and they were sparring at, at the boundaries. And their solution to that was just stick them together and see what happens. Um, and certainly plenty of things happened. Um, there was plenty of storming, forming, and performing. And I say in the paper, I don't think apps were ever normed. It just, <laughs> there was always something going on. Um, by the late 90s, um, uh, uh, the dryland farming systems team was my major focus. I took over that role from Bob McCown, and really it was Peter and I who were, who were uh, co-leading this, and it was the CSRO dimension of Apps Room. Um, uh, somewhat unusually for the time, we had a part of our agenda was this uh, program uh, or theme, I think we called them. No, in fact, they were called Key Result Areas in that day, KRAs. But um, it was called Improved Tools and Approaches for RDNE in Farming Systems. Um, um, I'm just watching the time there, trying to work out what it, what it means. It's counting down. Thank you. Um, so um, that explicit attention to research tools and approaches actually is probably going to be uh, turned out to be our biggest legacy. Um, so I was still active in research projects at this time. I'm going to flick through really quickly a couple of things. We, we were using the early models to look at drought frequencies. There was a big drought in 91 to 94 uh, in this region. Uh, the details aren't important here. We're looking at water excess in the farming systems and leakiness in rela relation to how the system was configured across the Murray-Darling Basin mainly. Um, pretty active in, in nitrogen management and sugarcane, looking at balancing um, production issues and uh, environmental risks, and even taking that work um, into the wider landscape scale, looking at contaminant loads over groundwater systems. Uh, and um, I have to say, two of um, my early hires, uh, Neil Huth and Kirsten Verberger, are in that slide. And um, um, one of the most uh, joyous things about having a long career in agriculture is is seeing the people you hire succeed. So I'll just nominate those two, two of many. Um, by, by about 2000, CSRO tropical agriculture had melted down uh, and we ended up in a division called CSRO Sustainable Ecosystems, of all things, really weird division, you might think. And it was weird in many ways, but uh, I was leading the agricultural landscapes program and we were half ecologists and half agronomists. Now, you can imagine how that went. We had a lot of interesting times, um, um, but uh, I think we're all the better for it. Um, by the mid-2000s, I was chief of CSRO Sustainable Ecosystems. Uh, pretty interesting time. A new, a new CEO in CSRO basically trying to get rid of the chiefs, uh, get rid of the divisions. Uh, and. Um, and so, uh, and I ended up actually um, uh, moving across to a flagship role. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, look, all through these, uh, going to these management roles, I'm sure most of my colleagues thought was going to the dark side. You know, you, you, you're pretty useless at different levels, and as you get higher up, you get even more useless. Um, I, I, I have some sympathy for that view, but um, I, I did try to keep 
my hand in Keep Connected. Um, this is uh, some work uh, I did with Peter Carberry again, uh, just looking at uh, framing uh, the decisions we make about uh, agricultural investments, uh, uh, research investments, and the pathways to, to affect change, framing that in terms of risk and return. Uh, and, uh, and that did get some traction in places like GRDC. Um, by about 2008 or so, I think, uh, the Sustainable Agriculture flagship had emerged. Uh, this pulled about seven divisions of CSR together into one big program focused on a whole range of productivity and environmental issues. Um, initially resisted by many, um, but I sense uh, these days, I get a sense that it was um, seen as the, some of the best of times now. Uh, we did, it was a really productive time and, and uh, we did make a difference, I think, in CSRO. That's, that still, still uh, is reflected in what's going on today. Um, so we've gone from white pigs now through to looking at the global food challenge, global food security, uh, and, and framing some of the uh, issues uh, around resolving that by, by about 2014. And then completely useless by this stage as, um, um, as an executive responsible for CSRO Agriculture, Food and Health, uh, joining a new CEO. Um, and um, so looking back now, crazy time, but for me, a really nice bookend to my career. I told you about that phone call from Ted Hensel, which says, come over for a chat. Uh, there could be a job in CSRO. So 36 years later, I ended up doing the same job Ted was doing, because uh, he was one of the first uh, that had that executive role in CSRO. OK. Um, I now want to throw the, the, cast the net wider. And I'll tell my, my sponsors here and my managers here that I'm about two or three minutes late <laughs> at this point. So I'm going to do my best. Uh, um, but we'll see how we go. So as I said, my journey is a small window into this wider journey. Uh, let, let's talk about the wider journey. No better place to start than CM Donald in this talk. So it was Donald in 65 who first created this iconic plot of Australian wheat yields. And his own contributions for super and sub clover are, are built into that graph. I, I sense this plot encouraged agronomists to look beyond their experimental white pigs to the bigger forces shaping the evolution of Australian agriculture. Uh, Donald's uh, most significant step towards charting a new course in agronomy and, and his growing interest in breeding came via his considerations of the crop ideotype, uh, a concept that came to define the later part of his career. Uh, he built this work out of his work on plant competition uh, and plant architecture. and, and um, but as far as I can determine, uh, he never tried to translate this qualitative model uh, to, to a on, put it on a quantitative basis. Now, there was another ch chap, a Dutchman, uh, who was also working on competition at the same time in the early 60s, uh, uh, C.T. De Witt. Um, De Witt was clearly more mathematically inclined, and his studies always involved some sort of quantitative analysis. By 68, DeWitt was writing code and building one of the world's first crop simulation models um, in the Netherlands. And then the third, third axis of this um, triangle, uh, third point of this triangle is the US. So Bill Duncan um, uh, was a, a fertilizer industry um, engineer and returned to graduate school in the US in, at the age of 58 to get his PhD. Uh, and he began writing some of the first crop simulation models in the US. And he put it this way, one way of putting what we know about the parts of a system back together to see how it functions as a whole. That was what was motivating him. Um, now, Australia was up there too in, this, in, in the 60s in this uh, sort of journey to a quantitative analysis of, of uh, crop environment uh, relationships. Uh, um, one of the earliest applications of computers to solve water balance came from Australia. 
because we had this pioneering view of agriculture and they were assessing agricultural potential of vast areas of the country in Northern Australia in particular. Um, so Ralph Slatcher and his team, um, uh, early reports from CSRO's land use research land assessment unit. Uh, they had a, a model called Watt Bell running on the Cyber 76 in Canberra. So Slatcher's team, Nix, Fitzpatrick, Teague, McAlpine, and I think by the early 70s, John Angus was in there as well. Um, so Henry, Henry Nix, uh, this is 68, um, early models of crop yield linking uh, soil water to environmental attributes and crop development. Um, now another key player in this story is Bob McCown. Uh, Bob was really impressed by what was coming out of Canberra in the water balance work. And he took it and started linking it to pasture growth and animal production in Northern Australia. Uh, I, I still recall Bob would always uh, often tell me of stories of running jobs from Townsville on the Cyber 76 in Canberra. What would happen if you got one card out of order? You'd run the thing all night, come back the next day and just get a huge print out of nothing. And you'd have to start again. Um, uh, developments overseas, in the US, um, um, uh, series, Grow Models, um, Joe Ritchie, Jimmy Jones, and others. Uh, um, developments, um, some of uh, DeWitt's students, people like um, uh, Fritz Prenning de Ries, Martin Croft, Herman Van Coolen, um, perhaps Rudy Rabinage, I think he might have been a DeWitt student as well. Um, they were, they were developing models. They were promoting a global conversation around systems analysis and modelling. And um, um, there was also stuff happening here in Australia. Um, uh, lots of individual activities around particular crops. Um, look, I'll flag out um, Hammer and McKeon as a pretty relevant example here. Brian, Brian Hearn on cotton. And of course, uh, Martin Stapper. Um, uh, John Angus again uh, in the south. Uh, during the 1990s, um, there were links, pretty strong links between the Australian efforts, the US efforts, and the, and the Dutch efforts. Uh, and that sort of tri triumvirate uh, is really still strong today. And those three uh, regions, you think, would be the strongest uh, leaders in, in this area. Um, I mentioned Bill Duncan. Um, uh, I'm not going to read this whole quote in the, in the interest of time, but this is Bill Duncan in 75, and I was impressed by it. I'll just read the last part. An important use of almost any simulator is the ans answer to the question, what would result if? With the simulator and historical weather records, one can learn what would have resulted over past years and use the new practices or, or, or varieties, from the use of new practices or varieties. Um, so um, that's one of the earliest really powerful uh, outlines of, of this vision for how models can inform agronomy. And, and those who were involved with APSA and Toowoomba will remember the what-if analyses and discussions which came to characterise um, uh, the approach in the 90s, uh, but uh, Bill Duncan was proposing that in 75. Um, Henry Nix again, in 85, had a vision for systems research. This idea that um, uh, resource data banks, crop system models could come together uh, and develop management prescriptions. So that was uh, Henry's term, management prescriptions. Um, and, um, and this started to put a little bit more structure around the sort of um, uh, emerging ideas about how models and agronomy could come together. Uh, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, farming systems research, FSR, was on the scene, particularly driven by um, international agricultural development, the CGIR, driven by a sense that um, on station research, um, with white pegs, I guess, uh, was not relevant to the needs of farmers um, so it was about taking, um, keeping the on-station research going, but to bring, bringing more of it on farm. Uh, 
uh, pretty quickly it became clear there were problems in interpreting those farm experiments and generalizing them to other soils or regions. So by 86, McCown was back in the scene talking about how we can combine operations research, systems analysis and modeling with, with um, farming systems research. This idea that you can, uh, you can start inserting models into this um, uh, on-station um, uh, world. Um, now, Bob, um, unlike Henry Nix, who talked about management prescriptions, Bob was starting to talk about action learning as the pathway by which uh, farmer practice could be influenced. A little, little side journey here, uh, my, one of my stories from Kenya. So I arrived in Kenya in 1985, had to come to grips with um, this completely new environment, smallholder subsistence farming. Uh, we did lots of white pig trials. We had an early version of series maize. Uh, we had the IBSNAT um, minimum data set manual and we had a computer, a, uh, an Olivetti M21 luggable. Um, it had an 8086 processor and a 10 megabyte hard disk. And we loved it. It was beautiful. I think you had one of these, Peter, too. We carried them all around the world, um, lugged them all around the world. That's Benson Wafula, my colleague w w with that computer. I think, and I'm happy to be corrected, but I think that might be the first personal computer used in sub-Saharan African ag research. Um, because um, up until that time, they had a mainframe up in Nairobi, um, a Wang or something, but no one could do anything with it. Um, I eventually plugged that machine in to the mainframe and stripped off the climate data. Uh, and we had to repair it all because every, every so many bits it would give a blip and, and, and we'd get an error. Anyway, enough on that. Um, we were one the, by 1990, we, the Climate Risk Symposium had come to Brisbane, um, a, a real watershed of a conference to this day. I think there's never been one better to, to really get, really transform the way uh, climate risk was approached in agronomic research. Uh, and uh, we put this, um, this um, pa uh, pa figure out using some early models on steps towards sustainable intensification. It wasn't caused, called that at the time, but we looked at how, um, how small inputs of nutrients and changing plant population and residues could, could start lifting output. Um, uh, when I left Kenya in the end of 89, um, uh, and the team, with John Williams' help, John Williams will be known to many here from soils part of CSRO, they set up a fantastic instrumented runoff trial, and they ran for 10 years with treatments not dissimilar to what we did in that um, modelling hypothesis work. Ran for 10 years. That's 20 seasons in Kenya. It's a bimodal rainfall regime. Um, about 10 years later, I was visiting, and they, the team there shared with me the data from those 20 seasons. Um, and uh, there are the average results for, the, um, for those seasons. And I've just put in blue there um, uh, approximate uh, translation to our, our initial hypothesis in 1990. Um, what can I say? That was really satisfying. Um, that in the three or four or five years that we were there, we were able to get our heads around what that system was doing, use the models to really improve our insights to its variability and risk, and come up with a hypothesis about some of the options forward. Uh, and, um, and 20 seasons later, it's shown to be pretty well on track. That actually went through into Southern Africa and Zimbabwe and colleagues like John Dimes and others took it up and started um, promoting this idea of microdosing uh, of small inputs of in fertiliser in, in smallholder farming systems. I'm going to speed up. Five, yeah. Ten. Oh, ten. I've got plenty of time. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, look, um, the detail on this is not important. It's just giving you this, this, this narrative. That's what's important. So by 1990, um, I was back in Australia. Uh, Apsheru was forming. People were gathering in here in Toowoomba uh, from different parts of the country. Peter came down from Townsville. Um, Graham Hammer and Dave, Dave was already here, I think. Graham Hammer came up from Brisbane. A and we, um, we 
so it had all this experience building models uh, and adapting existing models, and it became pretty clear to us that we created a monster trying to model a farming system with basically individual crop and soil models. And, and uh, so we had to start again and thinking about a really new platform uh, that we could use to really deal with uh, farm systems rather than crop crops. So the diagram on the left is the oldest, I think, so, and happy to correct, be corrected on this. I think it's the oldest surviving um, vision for what AppSim might become. It's, it's, it's come off a whiteboard in a meeting in Townsville in September 1990, and you can start to see how there are many elements there which ended up uh, in AppSim, which is on the right in, as it's first published. Now, uh, so I'm actually stopping there with telling the story. I just want to do some reflections now. Um, I will refer you to the written paper, which I think is going online today, which, which uh, unpacks a lot of this far more than I can do here today. But um, so I'm going to reflect on, um, on these topics. So let's start with AppSyn. Um, um, so um, this, this graph tracks the citations for the three key reference papers for AppSyn. There were three. One in 96, one in 2003, and one in 2014. And um, you'll, see, you'll see them accumulating. Uh, some of those citations um, double up, and, 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 but many are yeah, indiv individual. The bottom line there is um, um, uh, AppSim's, I'll be bold and say, probably the most cited output of Australian agronomy of all time. Um, globally, there are three quarters of a million uh, agronomy or agriculture multidisciplinary papers on the web of science. Now, so AppSim, depending on how you count the, the doubling up, is in the top 10 of the three quarters of a million. So it, it's certainly had a big impact in terms of its use. I'm not saying that's the same as impact, by the way. I'm very aware of the limitations of citations. But it's, it's caught people's attention and been used. It's been used on lots of things. They're all the topics, if you start classifying them. By 2020, about half of those topics are agronomy or climate change adaptation or mitigation. It's been used in over 40 countries, uh, about half in Australia and China. But what about impact, you might say? Um, the, paper, the written paper goes into this and reviews this in some length. I'm going to give one slide here, because I knew I'd be short of time. One slide, which is my reflections, looking back at all this, the impact studies and uh, evidence. So in terms of model use in agronomic research by researchers, uh, there's really strong evidence of transformational impact. Uh, agronomy research is different now than it was when I started in 73. Uh, in terms of model use in government and industry policy, there's some evidence of some impact. I think it's still patchy. Uh, uh, government policy is a few examples. Uh, industry policy is actually a little bit more, particularly in the investment decision making by, by R&D corps and so on. Uh, model use by, by um, farmers and, and advisors. Um, there's evidence of great value, but really big questions remain on sustained use. Uh, let's, let's, um, unpack, let's unpack that last point in <clears throat> just with this, um, this question. So um, direct use by farmers and to develop strategies and manage operations. This was the original motivation of pioneers like Duncan and Henry Nix. DSS development was a big driver in Apsru's formation. I think it's what our managers expected we'd be doing. The last 30 years of experience shows that models have, have deep value for farmers, but, uh, but not routinely as a standalone decision tool, I think is our, uh, my, sorry, my conclusion. Uh, and the conclusion of some, some of my colleagues. Uh, and I'll refer to Bob McCown at this point. So McCown's thesis was that the value lay as an adjunct to farmer intuition. Um, so Bob's last two papers address this issue uh, at some length in both theoretical and practical terms. Um, 
the current hype around the Internet of Things and digital twins and, and all those um, digital agriculture sort of issues um, may ultimately provide us with new evidence, new insights and new opportunities uh, for model use um, in farm management. But, but exciting as these developments are, I think the lesson I take from what I've seen is that treating farms as cybernetic systems um, and loss of, the sight, loss of sight of the human element of farming is likely to result in disappointment again. So, Australian agronomy in 2022. So my contention at the outset of the talk was agronomy was seen as more of an empirical art than a rigorous science discipline. My contention now is that agronomy has indeed reinvented itself over the last 50 years. The traditional elements of observation and white pigs are as relevant today as they ever were. So I'm not saying we've replaced white pigs, um, but these approaches are much more likely now to be set in the context of farm systems rather than a particular piece of farm technology. And much more explicit attention is given to the longer term uh, sustainability and the riskiness of the whole operation. And, and models have demonstrated their value as an essential aid to agronomic interpretation and e uh, extrapolation. So I'm not saying ANOVAs still aren't done, but I'd say uh, we're, we're much more likely to see uh, models that as adjuncts to our experimental um, interpretation than just an analysis of variance. Um, so, and I look forward to further advances in, uh, in some of the amazing things that ICT is offering. Um, Internet of Things, digital twins, advances in sensing, machine learning, model data fusion, and so on. So I look forward to seeing how, how these possibilities unfold in practice. Sorry. So what, what challenges, I'm, gonna, I'm just about wrapped up, what challenges lie ahead? Um, uh, still issues about making sure the software infrastructure and the science software linkages are, are really healthy. Um, um, uh, we um, need to continue investing in the science that underpins the models. Um, I really worry about the human capabilities and capacities um, in model development and use, and both require uh, significant um, training and development uh, and, um, and appropriate engagement between, if you like, science agencies and commercial de delivery pathways. Oh, sorry, let me go back. So, um, this is the last slide um, in, in content terms anyway. So in preparing this, this talk and more importantly the written paper, um, um, I couldn't help but be impressed by the, well, I saw a really positive uh, energy exhibited by the keynote papers at the last agronomy conference. Um, so Donald's 1965 plot was reworked by Prattley and Kierkegaard. Uh, and agronomy and breeding are out a key um, drivers to the progress since 65. Um, um, the influence of the last 50 years of evolution in agronomic methods uh, comes across very strongly in all the keynotes virtually all the keynotes, particularly the role of systems analysis and modelling. So my contention is Australian agronomy is now bound by both white pegs and silicon chips, and that's a healthy thing. Um, Hunt and Kierkegaard, uh, who are both here today, call for, I think, transformational agronomy. Uh, I enjoyed that paper. But I came to the conclusion that what they were calling for is much in common with the story I've been going through today. This journey of farming systems research meeting operations research and embedded in a participative action research paradigm. So, um, in the paper I call this digitally enhanced systems agronomy, um, trying to place systems agronomy at the centre and the digital tools as the enhancement, complementary. I don't expect that name to stick, it's pretty clumpy, but hopefully you can get what I'm on about, digital enhancement of systems agronomy. So I have a few thank yous, Peter. Um, 
Thank you uh, to the Australian Society of Agronomy and to the nominators who've got me up here today for the Donald Medal. Um, I found 199 co-authors in the Web of Science. Shame I, <laughs> I should keep going for one more paper. Um, who was it? It was Bradman, wasn't it? It went out at 99.96 or something. Is that the right number? Yeah. Um, look, um, I've got to thank CSRO. 36 years, um, lots of trials and tribulations. I'm sure those of you who are still with CSRO or working with it, but in my view, still a national treasure. University of Queensland, where I started and, and back, my Apsheru colleagues, we had such a great time. ACR, uh, I haven't really told you the full ACR story here, but another national treasure in my view. And of course, international colleagues. Uh, I wanna dedicate this oration to Bob McCown. So Bob played a key part in my own agronomic journey, and I would contend not an insignificant part in the wider global journey over the last 50 years. So, thank you, Bob. Um, lots of great teams over the years. The Kenya team, uh, Apshru in the early 90s, a lot of storming and forming going on there at that meeting. I think it was a team building meeting. Um, my mates uh, on our first trip to the USA, Peter Carberry and I were, were novice travelers to the US. And um, you can see what great dress sense we had in those days. In fact, I nearly, nearly shouldn't be here because Graham Hammer was driving a big American car on the wrong side of the road and, we nearly <laughs> and stopping on the wrong side of traffic lights. But it was a, our big US um, road trip through the Midwest. It was a great time. There's Richard Vandalit uh, in that photo. My mates from uh, Kenya, uh, the farmers from Kenya that we work with, and finally, um, my wife and two children um, who have supported me in this whole journey. And th in that photo, in 1986, getting on the train in Nairobi to head to Mombasa, um, and our two, two young kids. So um, thank you to them for, for this great support. So thanks, Peter. That's it.